Welcome, everybody. Um, okay, so in the exhibition, Incarnations, African Art as Philosophy, artist Kendall Gears and collector Sindika Dokolo want to supply visitors with a new way to look at African art. By presenting classic and contemporary African art together in dialogue, their hope is that an Afrocentric perspective can be brought to the way in which we look at African art. But what is an Afrocentric perspective? How do we understand better African art by bringing that Afrocentric view into the way in which we're looking at the art? And what is African art anyway? Why are we putting the African in front of the art? So good evening, uh, good morning and good afternoon to those that are joining us on social. Uh, my name is Adinike Cosgrove, I am founder of Imadara, and I'm joined today in this panel discussion by Kendall Gears and Ugo Chuku Smooth Unzewi. Did I get that right? <laughs> and uh, close enough. <laughs> and he is the curator of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Now, the subtitle for this discussion is Decentralizing Curatorial Practices and Bringing in Audience Engagement. So we want this to be very interactive. If you have any questions at all, during the discussion, please put your hand up. We'll bring a microphone to you. If you have any questions on social media, type in those questions and we'll address them. And if you're a little bit shy, but you have a really burning question, we're handing out pieces of paper as well so you can write those questions down, bring it to the front, and we'll make sure to address those questions. And so with that, uh, let us start with introductions. So Smooth, why don't you kick us off? Uh, can you please give us a brief, brief <laughs> introduction into your career? Um, and, and really, as, as you're thinking of that introduction, some might ask, what is a black African man who is promoting this Afrocentric perspective to art do doing curating at a global institution like MoMA? Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. So the question is, um, two questions. I see two questions. First, what, is, what led me to MoMA? And what am I doing at MoMA, uh, in a sense? Um, so I, I trained as an artist uh, at uh, the University of Nigeria in Suka, um in the late 90s. And after my training, I was making art and also exhibiting art with other artists uh, who, in Nigeria back then, who couldn't, um, because there were no curators, basically. And in the course of making exhibitions in Nigeria, I began to think seriously about what it means to be, um, to be an artist who works at the international stage, uh, what it means to be a curator who, from Africa who wants to be heard. But I was also concerned with um, what I called at that time uh, the politics of inclusion and exclusion as it related to, um, to, uh, the, the Af to African artists, artists from Africa, uh, artists of African descent who were, who, leave, who were living and working in Africa, but wanted to have a visibility as their colleagues from elsewhere. So these were some of the burning questions for me in the very beginning, which led me towards uh, the curatorial path down the line. And I was, at that time, fascinated by what I called, um, by the emerging art biennials in, in Africa. Uh, so for example, the Dakar Biennale is often seen as the, the biennial in Africa. It's 
a biennial that makes the case that it's, it promotes, it discovers, promotes, and launches the careers of African artists onto the international stage. And so whenever there's a dark at biennial, you have tons of, of international visitors coming to Senegal for, for that reason. On the other hand, I was involved with what we call this uh, Africa Heritage Biennial in Nigeria, a tiny biennial organized by this group of artists who I was affiliated with and was working with at that time. And no matter what we did, we could never get international attention for this biennial, you know? And, and so in the very beginning, my burning question was how, how does an artist or a curator or an art event in Africa get to be seen uh, at the international level? And of course, um, there's always a question of the, economic, the economics around, around visibility, which is something we don't very often talk, talk about very well, which I think hampered um, that biennial that we were working on in Nigeria. But there's also the question of uh, state interest, uh, which is the case with the Dakar Biennale, because it's uh, a biennial supported and promoted by the government. So I was interested in, in what makes one visible and the other one not invisible. So that was at the very beginning. And so that led me to, uh, to decide and to, to, to uh, find a career as a, as a curator. Um, I trained uh, traditionally as an art historian in the, in the United States. And my first job as a curator in the United States was at the Teaching Museum, uh, the Hood Museum of the, uh, Dartmouth College. And it, there, I, again, I was more invested in trying as much as possible to, to opening up the space for artists uh, from Africa, you know. And so when you go to, the, to Dartmouth, when they think about global contemporary, uh, at the Dartmouth College's uh, Hood Museum of Art, what they think of as global contemporary? Is Af it's artists from Africa's work in that collection. And from the, from the hood, I went to, um, to the Cleveland Museum of Art, and from the Cleveland Museum of Art, I'm now currently at uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So what, what is a black, why is a black curator at MoMA? Uh, to begin with, MoMA describes itself as um, a global institution. Uh, MoMA is the first museum that began invested in the story of modern art, when other institutions were more encyclopedic. Um, but in the very beginning, um, not the first exhibition of, of African art, what some would call the classical canon, meaning the, 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 other, the other kind of art that is in incarnations, the, the classical tradition. The first exhibition of African art in the United States was actually done at MoMA, uh, Negro Art of 1935. So if you want to think about uh, a museum in the United States that first centered African art, I, I bet, the, the historical tradition, it was actually the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and in the mid-century, MoMA was, quite, was invested in collecting modern arts in a global context. And so uh, Alfred Barr, who was the, the first director of MoMA, visited uh, what was then called Southern Rhodesia. He visited Dakar, he traveled around Africa, he collected Ibrahim El Salahi when El Salahi was, uh, was visiting New York. Uh, in, in the 60s. So there was that push in mid-century to collect globally. Uh, but the question is, what then happened after the... It kind of stopped. It kind of stopped. It stopped there yeah. was a period of quiet uh, where quiet. we didn't really hear about Africa. Yes. So, so, so the 60s was that golden, golden age because there was um, that sense of renaissance in Africa with independence and all of that. And so, so internationally, people were invested uh, in, in the new. And Africa was, uh, was a kind of new. And MoMA was part of that, that, that conversation. Um, then in the 70s, uh, things went south, you know, uh, across board. And so, oh, things went north, if we, if we want to go that way, you know. In, in the 70s, into the 80s, and, and I think that was really where the challenges of uh, nation building uh, began to be felt, uh, not only in Africa, but even in, in Latin America and in Asia, where, where countries that have obtained independence began to do the actual uh, heavy lifting on in, of uh, nation building. And at that time, I often make the argument that, that the Cold War had a role to play in the way in which um, uh, uh, modernism in the non-Western 
context began to disappear from the conversations of, um, of, um, of international arts, you know, because um, there was this two blocks. Yeah, that was, you were part of that or you were part of the other one, you know. So, 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 so smooth. Yeah. Bringing it back to you. Yes, I want to say. Why are you a MoMA? Yes, yes, I want, I want, I'll get okay. to that. And so that was what happened. Yes. And MoMA mm. finally decided they wanted to return to its roots. The root being that the global is very important. You know, uh, the new MoMA, as it describes itself today, wants to tell a more dissented story. They want to uh, tell a more en all encompassing uh, story about about art in its, in its global ramifications. And part of doing that is to re return, or to return attention to narratives that have, over the years, been excised from the conversations of, of global, uh, modern, and contemporary art. And they began to look for artists, for curators, who can help expand. Uh, who can the help kind of, fill the gaps? Help expand, I prefer that term, okay. as opposed to fill in the gap. Help expand the conversation to, to truly center MoMA as a global institution. That's why I'm at MoMA. Okay, thank you. And Kendall, who are you? <laughs> no, but as, again, I'm asking very direct questions here, but as a white South African man, who some people would consider in a position of power, right, because of the whiteness and because of the maleness, working with an established collector in putting together this exhibition, what was your role in that? And I guess, what, how are you feeling coming into this exhibition and building incarnation? Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here on this very distinguished panel of two people who I respect deeply. Um, and you might even ask the question, what is an artist doing in the first place curating? Um, and indeed, my journey journeys from the beginning into curating pretty much follow the same um, impulse as smooth as being an artist, seeing exhibitions, but not seeing the exhibitions I would like to see, feeling invisible, feeling that the artist whose work I respected are, is invisible. So I started to make shows in order to try and show the things I would like to see. I started to curate the shows that I wished I could see. Um, but first and foremost, I'm an artist. And I approach this question of being an artist from a very humble point of view, in the sense that, for instance, the first, the end of your question is, you know, the dialogue with a distinguished collector is a friendship. It's really about a collector and, and an artist and two human beings who connect on a human level, having discussions about what African art might be. And we pass the ball around, I challenge him, he challenges me. And in this way, it's a bit like, you know, having a dinner. And, you know, and, and a good dinner is definitely at least a three-course meal um, with a lot of wine and laughter and jokes and also serious discussion. And so the, 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 the exhibition comes together really not as me curating, but me working with Syndica in dialogue, discussion, um, trying to also share that discussion with friends. Artists, and that's what's, what's really important is that, what, you know, Syndica might be a distinguished collector, but he doesn't invest in works of art in the idea of the market. This is we perhaps we'll come to that later. The market being, you buy a work of art, you hold on to it, and then you sell it. You make an investment in an object. Syndica invests in art and in artists, and it's a long-term investment in trying to support languages, trying to support the way that one might be almost in a Renaissance idea of a patron, a philanthropist, in order to nurture a language by supporting things that are not getting the support because things went the wrong way. And the kinds of art that, that, that he might be interested in, or the kinds of art that I might be interested in, is not getting the support of MoMA, not getting the support of the Basel Art Fair, not getting the official support. So somebody has to step in and take care of that in order to build the language and the tradition. Now, the question of being a white man Obviously, today is a very, very important question, and I think Trump has done a lot in order to elevate the crisis of whiteness and maleness. Um, he mentioned it first. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, okay, let's first say, I mean, at its most basic, my family has been in Africa for 300 years. At what point do you become African? At what point do you earn the right to say, I'm an African? Now, I'm Afrikaans. 
And I've been called out. People have accused me of being a boor. If that's the word you want to use in a pejorative way, I am a South African, I'm an Afrikaans, working class person, rooted in the African soil, culture, and heritage. Now, the best way to explain, so the, the, the idea of, now, I will not deny that whiteness and maleness provide certain forms of authority, provide certain degrees of power and respect. I mean, a lot of what the exhibition is about is trying to address how we define our ideas of beauty, our ideas of aesthetics, our ideas of power. So, you know, the, the idea of the Black Panthers is right at the beginning of the exhibition for good reason, in order to address our constructions of the, the, the stereotypes of power. So, you know, I mean, and I say when I do the tour of the exhibition, how come it's taken from the 1969, 60, late 60s, Black Panther political movement to get to 2018 before Black Panthers becomes the first black superhero. Why is every superhero a white male and now we have white woman and a black superhero? I mean, so I understand the, 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 the power relations implicit. Now, how might I address that as a white man without feeling, I mean, I certainly feel guilty but at the same time, I don't want to be decimated by that guilt. I want to be proactive and engaged and actually make a difference. And the best way I could explain it is, you know, African people like to tell stories. So I'll tell you a story, which is about where I come from, which is South Africa. And right now, in South Africa, in the last weeks, I wrote a text that literally had me weeping every time I tried to write it. The tears were rolling. And if I start crying now, I'm sorry. But it is because right now, in South Africa, there's a genocide taking place. In the sense, there's a war against women. Women are being raped and murdered daily. The statistics are beyond. More people are murdered in South Africa every single year than were executed in Dachau and Buchenwald together during the entire Nazi era. More women are raped in South Africa than anywhere else in the world. And it's not in the news. What's in the news is the, 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 the xenophobia. The reason why xenophobia is in the news is because it doesn't happen every day. The rape and murder is not in the news because it happens every day, every single day. Now, why do I speak about this? I speak about this because on social media, I saw this hashtag, men are trash. And I want you to know, what does that mean? Men are trash. And I, you, know, you look it up on social media and it says, it goes against community guidelines. So you can't even see. The violence is so intense that people, it's actually forbidden. And of course, my first impulse was, not me. Men are trash, but not me. I'm not that kind of man because I'm not sexist. And I did research into why women are saying men are trash. And what they're saying is that, wait a minute, we need to draw attention to this atrocity, this crime against humanity being taken place. And men are trash because, we, because every man who looks the other way becomes complicit. Now the equivalent would be during Nazi Germany, and I, and I don't like to go there, but it does make the point. Not every German was a Nazi, correct. But when you looked the other way, when atrocities were taking place, you were complicit. So this idea of men are trash means you have to make your voice known. Take your position of power and do something about it. Why is it that only women are protesting the sex crimes in South Africa? Why is it only women who are going out on the streets talking about rape when men should be doing it as well? So in that way, it's about, okay, if you have power, use your power to create a voice. And the thing that is vital through the whole exhibition, from the very first work to the very last work, is I... And in my opening speech for, for, for the press conference for the exhibition, I spoke about the right to speak. Now, this is very important. I will not speak on behalf of anybody other than myself, because it's only me that I know, and I can speak about my struggle, and I can speak about what it is to be a white male. I cannot speak on behalf of somebody else, because the second I do that, I'm saying they can't speak for themselves. Then, in that way, I'm saying you're not my equal. And what's really important is I, the whole idea of this exhibition was to put it out there so that the works, the artists, the discourse, the subjects need a voice 
to be able to speak. So that's, and it, that's and an then, interesting point. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're starting to get into the next question that we have, which is about nomenclature and definitions, right? Uh, you started talking about historical and classic and what we're calling the older pieces and community. So when we think about, you know, Afrocentric view of African art, for those that might not really understand where we're coming from there, what exactly do we mean by having that Afrocentric view on the way in which we're engaging with the art? Should I go first and then I mean, pass it to both? It's your show, so you start. Right. So I, I will be quick on this one yeah. because I can use a very beautiful anecdote, which is go and see the exhibition. And there's, when you arrive in the exhibition in the very first room, when you see the very first masks. Now, let's say Africa, there's beadwork, there's all kinds of, you know, there's fabrics, there's figures, there's masks. There's many things, not only masks. But when you encounter your two first masks, masks on the exhibition, the two beautiful Kitve masks, and you see the one is facing you, and the other one is facing away from you. And this makes the point about when we look at the mask, the Afrocentric point of view is the back of the mask, not the front of the mask, because the mask is made to be worn, it's made to be danced, it's meant to be performed. It's not meant to be put into a vitrine for people to look at. And the Eurocentric point of view is to look at it in terms of its lion shape, form, and color. I, I mean, I, 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 like, I like approaching the, the question through, through, through the visuals. I think it makes a lot of sense. But I, but I think, to put it in very stark terms, um, there is the Eurocentric position of how we consume the world, how we present ourselves in the world. And very often than not, our understanding of the world, even back in Africa, due to the accident of colonialism, has been through the lens provided by Europe. And so even the consumption of, of African art um, has always been through the way in which um, Africa was discovered by Europe. So if you think about, um, in the very beginning, what was the interest of African art in the historical, the interest of the West in the historical traditions of African art, it was more focused on what one might call formalism, you know, uh, the aesthetics of, of the object. And the aesthetics was driven by, by, by the market. Uh, the aesthetic led to the discovery of the market. And we, we can talk about the, uh, the, the uh, about Picasso and the others who happened upon, upon African masks in Tocadero and, then, and that gave rise to, to Western art from, from the 20s onward. But the real, the real individuals that played a role in the way African art was invented and presented to the world were dealers at the turn of the 20th century who were more interested in, in, in the form, you know. And so, you have, that, you have that approach, which is a typical, a typical uh, Eurocentric approach to African art, and then subsequently you have the academic approach to, to African art, which was really to, fo to focus on the function of the object. You know? um, what I like with the exhibition is the way this exhibition destabilizes both uh, the academic approach, which is more focused on the function, and the, the market-driven uh, approach, which was much more which was focused initially on a formalist uh, engagement with the object and the way in which they interacted uh, with, with their understanding of Africa as a place. So that's what I find uh, interesting about the exhibition. But I'm going to ask a question to, to Kendo, because that was a question that, that, that came to me uh, yesterday when we, we were having the walkthrough. You describe, um, especially with the historical kind, because we're trying to identify what the Afrocentric position would be, uh, one would say it's, it's, the Africa's, it's Africa's response to its art might be the Afrocentric position. I think that's the position you want to take with the show. Uh, although you also make the claim that you can speak for yourself without aiming to speak for, for Africa. But one of the things you said yesterday that struck me as interesting, but also very challenging, was when you describe uh, the, the understanding of the object. Now, what makes the object uh, African art is the embodied spirit that the objects take on. I'm interested in, in that embodied spirit. Um, interested in the sense that we, we often discuss Africa with that sense of um, ritual. I mean, you, you, you hinted at all of that, ritual, dance, and, and all what not, you know, as, a way, as, as the definitive character of African art, but I, have a, I also find it very challenging that one can discuss uh, historical African art without think, thinking about some of those stereotypes that you would want to mention, without thinking about 
rhythm, for example, without thinking about motion, for example, without even thinking about ritual. And so when you said embodied spirits, it posits the idea that for the object to be object, that something supernatural should reside in the object. Why so? You want, how long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very long question that I will just touch the tip of the iceberg of. Um, because interesting, when you speak about, you know, the, when you're speaking about African art, you are speaking about the moment when it leaves Africa. You're not actually speaking about the moment when it was still in Africa. And that's also very important. The Afrocentric point of view is to go back to the moment before it leaves Africa, when it was still an object or, a, or you know, I mean, let's not also generalize. I mean, there's everything from beadwork to, to masks to rituals. But within the context of the people who made those things, there's very different understandings of it than once it leaves the continent. And once it leaves the continent, then it acquires value by the names of the people who owned it. Now, you, 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 you brought up earlier the, the, the Cold War. Now, what's also interesting is to... One of the points of the exhibition is to relocate Africa as an equal continent on the other side of the Mediterranean as part of the global dialogue exchange of ideas and everything. And, and just in terms of the Cold War, in terms of my own personal experience, apartheid is legislated 1948 and it ends in 1990. Interesting coincidence. The Cold War was playing out in Africa as well. But what was interesting is that when you, you, we were talking about, you know, what, what, how did you, ex you say it? You talk about the Cold War and, 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 mo and, and modernism. Now, now the, thing about, the fascinating thing about the Cold War, which I'll bring to bear on this discussion about African art as philosophy, is during the Cold War, Franz Fanon came up with this idea of the Third World. And the Third World was, at that time, not pejorative economic um, disenfranchisement, but it was, there's the capitalists, there's the, the communists, and he was the idea of the non-aligned movement, which would be, we take the third position, which can take what we want from both the capitalists and the communists, and develop our own kind of politics. And in a way, my idea of African art, in terms of this idea of embodiment, is we, Africa is connected to the rest of the world, in the sense that, we, you know, if you, you read the catalog and you look at the history, the Congo, the Congo kingdom was Christian since 1491 that has an effect on the way people think. There is dialogue and exchange. The Christianity would have seeped into the, 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 the rituals, the beliefs, the faiths, the way people conducted their lives and the things that, that, even if they were rejecting it or even if they were accepting it, it had an influence. And I think that that would have been throughout Africa because even, you know, we, we imagine colonialism starts at the end of the 18th century. No, it goes way back and it goes even to pre-colonial times. There was always exchange. Now, how might these things evolve in a syncretic way. And you know, what is in important was the, the exhibition does take its cue from the discussion from Suleiman Bachediadni and his book, African Art as Philosophy, where he speaks about this idea of emotion and embodiment and spirit. And one of the things that for me is very important about this exhibition is that the reason why MoMA, and I'm sorry to be cynical here, but I think the reason why MoMA needs to open their doors is because the European um, the occidental art market as we understand it has been purged. You know, purged in the sense that um, the white cube gallery, for those of you who don't know, was invented in 1954 by Marcel Duchamp at an exhibition at Sydney Janus Gallery in New York. And what happened was Duchamp made his uh, found objects, his ready made in 1917, and he tried to exhibit them and nobody ever noticed them. They were just basically invisible. And he had to find a way to make the object visible. So he invented the white cube gallery. And then the object became visible. And in that moment, a purging began. Because up until that point, you think about the abstract expressions, you think about the, modern, the whole modernist movement, there was a spiritual concern. And art is very connected to spirituality. From 1954, from the white cube, the purging happens to the extent that not only does color get purged, emotion gets purged, movement, sound, everything gets purged to the point that there's nothing left. And the last thing to be purged is content. And the other thing left now is empty signifiers on walls being sold for other, no other reason than there are empty signifiers. And so let me just finish. Sure, and so ahead. this is, and, the, and what the challenge and the beauty of looking at classic African art is, I don't have to tell you there's a spirit there because you can see it for yourself. And that is inspiring. And this is my protest as well. So just to build on that, however, you walk through the exhibition, you look at the artworks, the contemporary, the classic artworks. The classic pieces are in technically a white cube. They're in a white box. They've got lighting. They're behind glass. 
It's a very but, small white cube. It, but it's still a white cube. <laughs> no, it's not. There's, the, a, there's mirrors there, and the, oh, no, it's not however, a white cube. However, they're in a white cube. The, they're not danced. The masks, they're not in a masquerade. They're not danced. There's no music. There's no engagement. There is music. There is music in some of the rooms. But in, in, in terms of the, the classic pieces themselves, they're not actually being danced in a masquerade. So I guess the question then becomes, how do you think African art should be exhibited or can be exhibited to express that spirit that you say an Afrocentric perspective needs to bring when you're viewing that art? I mean, I, I, mean, I think w when I hear spirits, um, I mean, I do find that very challenging, I'll be honest. Um, but I, I think of spirit in the sense of Geist, in a, in a very German sense, um, of vital force, um, which is a word I've used, um, because I also run away from emotions, because emotions uh, suggest um, the very famous Sangorian idea that emotion is to Africa, its reason is to, is to, is to Greek, which, is, which again is, reduces um, the way, the way Africans interact, Africa interacts with the world around them, true object, you know? So what it does is it condenses the way Africa makes sense of the supernatural to those objects. The objects are just, a, they serve as, as, as a conduit, as a conduit through which uh, people make sense of the world they live in. So I don't think, um, I don't necessarily think um, the object in themselves contains that sort of spirit. It's a way of understanding the unknowable, you know? And so in an exhibition, like that, it's important to understand the object as, um, as, uh, as containers in that sense, but not bearing spirits. Because once you make the case that they bear, that they're embodied spirits, and then you make the case that, it, they've, that, that the reality of, of, the, of, of the spirit is when it was in Africa, and, they, and outside of Africa, spirits don't exactly travel. You know, once it's out of that original context, the spirit do not travel with the object. So what it means is that the objects, are, the, the objects in themselves are, are uh, containers uh, through which people make sense of, of their world. And it does not, re in, in the absence of Africa, outside of Africa, it doesn't necessarily reduce the way in which those objects allow people to continue to make sense of their, of their world. So in that exhibition, in interacting with contemporary works, the objects still serve that function of the issue of people still trying to make sense of their world, but they do not imbibe the vital force because that vital force, other guys, I think, requires the community to make it to be active, which is a case I've made in the past. So objects in the, in the original context needed to be danced. But aren't we the new community? Are we the community? Well, of course we're the community. So in that sense, uh, there's a different kind of strategy ongoing with the objects in that exhibition, and Kendall becomes uh, sort of the activator of a, a different kind of dance, you know. But the idea of spirit is something I still struggle with, you know, uh, the, because it reduces, again, like I said, it reduces the African experience to very basic tropes, you know. It's either you think about ritual, you think about sexuality. These are tropes you find being re regurgitated about African objects, and so I, and the concept of, of um, Engaging with, uh, with, with reality in its, in its abstractions are often not part of the conversation when we, th we talk about African art. And I think this, these are some of the considerations that are at play or went into play when those objects were conceived uh, in the historical past. And if we want to think about African art as philosophy, there, we, would, we should be able to, 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 to engage with, with the way in which people think about reality in, in, its, in, its, in all its abstraction which we don't consider when we talk about African art. I mean, I mean it's, speaking about spirit is very complicated because if we don't agree on the existence of spirit, we're never going to be able to agree. Um, but it is interesting that for the people from the Congo Basin, the word in Kisi referred to the object and the spirit, and they didn't make this distinction. And I do believe if the spirit was correctly embodied, it would travel with the object. Now, uh, now okay. I, would, I would like to now tell another story, okay? Another story, another anecdote, being that um, I remember go there, was a, there was an artist of my generation whose name I need not mention, whose work I absolutely loved. And everybody I knew absolutely loved this artist. And it was like, you know, it was the champion, it was the superhero of our generation. And it was, you know, somebody coming from the, the margins, so it was really the, the, the correct champion. And 
I remember loving this artist's work for many, many, many years, and then and I'd seen his work for you know over the and I always loved it. And at some point, I went to see a retrospective of his at a in a in a, in a museum in Paris, and I remember walking through the exhibition and feeling a loss, a deep sense of loss. I looked at works that I had always loved, and they looked they were dead. I looked at works I'd always loved, and I didn't understand it. And then everybody else who I was talking to was having the same comments. I, I don't know what changed. The works I used to love, I just don't love them anymore. And it was at that moment that I understood something very important, that, that in fact, works of art have a lifespan. They have an energy, they have a spirit. And if the artist can conjure a very powerful spirit like the Caves of Lascaux, that spirit can survive for 19,000 years. Other artists, and we know from the 1960s, we can see in the 1960s the superheroes on the front page of the magazines, and you look at the work now, and it's dead. So you don't have to necessarily speak of spirit in terms of some kind of supernatural being, but it's an energy, it's a life force, it's a, it's a vitality. And, and once I started to understand that, wait a minute, works of art die. And if works of art can die, therefore there must be a spirit embedded and embodied. And the great thing is, you know, when I look at a lot of the classic works here, they're very much alive. And that's the, then that becomes the challenge. And so, yes, we can't dance the mask because they're fragile, they're important, and the works will get destroyed. And not only that, it'll be disrespectful to dance the mask in Belgium when they should be danced in, you know, where they come from. But let's also imagine that the dance is not just some... Because we end up very quickly at this pejorative idea of sex, sexualized, eroticized, you know, these kind of primitives, noble savages. I'm not going there at all. I'm speaking about real sophisticated ritual, everything as sophisticated as the Catholic Mass, which is another ritual. Um, and what I'm speaking about is this idea of linking art to your life to your environment. So art is not something that is put, you know, there's that famous form of Chris Marco where he says, sculptures go to the museum to die. You know, this idea of bringing the museum alive, making the museum a living space where art is part of your community, part of your consciousness, part of your spirituality. And the great example is right now, if you go to London, you go to St. Paul's, it's empty. You walk directly over the bridge to the Tate and it's full. Why? Because art still has something to charge people with something to believe in. And if you believe in it, it must be spirit. Okay, so we've mentioned art. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Actually, yes. <laughs> round of applause for that. Oh, my gosh. Um, I think this is a good point to pause for a minute and see if there are any questions, because we've gone deep already. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions at all for Kendall or Smooth? We've got microphones. Any questions at this point? Okay, so um, we will continue then with um, what we call a thing. So Sindika, he's mentioned that his collection is not a collection of African art, but it's an African's collection of art. So what is African art? This was a question that I kind of opened with earlier. Why are we calling this African art, especially as we expand to the contemporary, especially as we think about the today, where does the Africa stop and it just becomes art? Why don't you start smooth? Oh, well, I, I mean, there are several ways to, to respond to this question. I think um, in the 1990s, which, which was uh, defined by identity politics, a lot of African art, a lot of artists who happened to be Africans, let me say it this way, uh, decided they, they didn't like the label because the label sort of uh, pl uh, places, placed them in a certain category. And they said if they are contemporaries from elsewhere were basically described as, as, as artists, then they should be described as artists, which is a fair argument. Um, quite recently, you, you notice that the market requires um, okay. uh, nomenclatures, because that's the way, I mean, the market requires classification in the same way museums also require classifications as a way of understanding uh, peoples and things, and, and categories are the way the market operates. But you might want to also look at it this way. Um, when people ask the question, is there anything really like African art? I often say uh, that someone like Jeff Koons is an American artist because all his references, in reality, are American pop culture. So he is an American artist. But the question is, why is he never addressed? 
as an American, uh, American artist. And then again, that's where the market comes into the conversation. Now, you also know that you hardly have the, cate the broad category of Asian artists. You have Indian artists, you have Japanese artists, you have Chinese artists, you know, you have British artists, you have um, German artists. These are categories that are very, very uh, valiant. They, they exist, you know. You describe Damien Hirst as a British artist. You don't necessarily describe him as a European artist, you know. Um, and that's the challenge that I think is it's of the, the challenge of African art. I mean, you might want to say it as um, a throw over from uh, the way in which the field itself was invented ab initio with the, the historical tradition, where a conglomerate of different uh, of ideas and peoples and cultures were put together and described as as African art. You know, you might see that as a, as a, a carryover from that from that tradition that people continue uh, the market uh, or the discourse continue to treat um, people people or artists with relations to Africa in that way. You can also say um, you can also make uh, a postcolonial argument to say that. Um, uh, Insofar there's the reality of, of, of countries, countries in Africa, say Nigeria, say Cameroon, say Sierra Leone and others, uh, that someone who wants to make a decolonizing argument might say, I do not believe in those cartographies, those, those, those borders. And so I would rather describe myself, if I want, with the nomenclature of African artists, because that's what I believe in. You know? That might be the colonial. The colonizing. As an African artist, <laughs> how do you feel about that label of African well, art? Well, I mean, I'd like to also go back to Jeff Koons and Frank Stella and Andy Warhol and Robert Rauschenberg, uh, these white male artists. Um, they're just the folk artists of a very small island called Manhattan. It just happens to be a very rich and powerful island, but they're just folk artists of a very small community. And there is something that, again, this exhibition addresses, and Cindy spoke about a lot yesterday, is the, the process, the crime against humanity called colonialism, disempowered African people and created racial prejudice where African people look in the mirror and they hate what they see. There's a self-loathing to be African. And, and this self-loathing translates into, if you want to prove that you're not African, you have to walk, talk, and look like a European. You have to show in London, Paris, and New York in order to prove you're not African, which is to say you're second class. And, this, this, and for me, no. It's why the map of the world is flipped around at the entrance to the exhibition. For me to call myself African is a protest because I'm proud to be African. I don't want to prove to the world why I'm African, because I know I'm African. And I don't want to prove what is the difference between African and European, because as soon as you're saying that, it's a European question. Because every African knows who they are, or should know who they are, so they don't have to prove it. So it's a protest for me, and a celebration of my identity. So then, where does Africa stop and black begin, or diaspora begin, or African-American begin. Do you know what I mean? Because it's... it's you've Are you asking the white guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, so if we're looking at this from an Afrocentric perspective, right, where, where, do, where do these lines begin and end, or is it just a blur? What is your take on diaspora art or African-American art in the context of this African art definition? Well, I mean, again, I'll go back to what I said about uh, the market inventing... Uh, categories, uh, because that's the way, I mean, I mean, take for an example, you walk into um, a grocery st store in the United States, and then you look at, you decide you want to go buy cereal, and then you can find more than 50 versions of the same cereal, you know, because that's the way the market works, you know. Now, the other question is, if you meet uh, someone from the Katanga province uh, in, in Congo, and say, who are you? I was going to say, He's going to first posit maybe his, his ethnic group, the area from which he comes from. Uh, the last thing that comes to his mind is that he's a black man because he's an African. He doesn't have to be a black man. And if you've read Chimamanda Adichie's Americana, one of the things she said that she became aware of her blackness when she moved to the United States, because this is not a conversation she had back in Nigeria. She was just Nigerian, Igbo, whatever it is, you know. And so 
the conceptualization of blackness in itself becomes something that happens when you when when your body leaves continental Africa and then you begin to 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 have to weigh yourself against your Eurocentric machinations, you know, the way in which Eurocentrism will want to define you in, in, in certain ways. That's one conversation. Then even in the, in the American context, uh, blackness in itself is a discourse uh, that sort of allows African Americans to find a space for themselves to exist as a people in the United States, you know. And that becomes a diaspora way of engaging with, with, with the realities of being, of being someone of African descent outside of Africa. You know, in Africa, I mean, I mean, of course, Fela Kuti would sing about the black man. Now, when he talks about the black man, the black man becomes a, a, a philosophical concept to, to rail against uh, uh, the history of subjugation and dehumanization. And so that's why you posit that. So if you go back to, uh, to the way in which the concept in itself evolved in the, in the African-American uh, um, reality is because of what they were faced with. And they have to find a vocabulary that allowed allow themselves to, to make sense of their reality in the West. And so the concept of the African diaspora, diaspora of course, there are two diasporas. Um, there is the, um, the diaspora catalyzed by events of the Middle Passage, uh, the transatlantic slave trade. And then there's the more recent diaspora that will include characters like myself and a lot of people in this room, you know. Um, again, it is a way of referencing uh, the re reality of being from somewhere but living elsewhere. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, and some of this, I mean, artists move in and out of Africa, you know. Uh, they embody multiple realities. But diaspora in itself is a category that was invented as a way of processing uh, people's experience as a, dis as, a, as a discourse, as a reality, but also as a discourse. And so, and so are they meaningful? Um, in terms of the way we ex experience uh, art? Yes and no. You know, because artists who make, uh, for example, in the United States, Wange Chimutu, for example, before she moved back to, to Kenya, some of the work she was making was, was detailing her experience of living in the United States. It wasn't, it wasn't accounting for living in the United States, but thinking about uh, that, that experience of being in the United States in relation to the experience of having come from Kenya. You know, so it's the diaspora in that sense is a way of, of thinking about, about the two worlds that certain artists inhabit. You know, the map of Africa as we understand it today was drawn up in 1884 and 1885 in Berlin by 13 European countries and the United States. There was not a single African person present to negotiate the territories being defined. It was Europeans deciding what Africa would be and where the countries would be. And there's the, the sculpture by, that was owned by Stanley on the exhibition, and Stanley was there to negotiate the Congo for Belgium at that conference. Now, this is an external imposition, much like when the anthropologists went to Africa and they studied the rituals, but they never bothered to take the names of the people who were dancing or the people who were making the objects, because they didn't care. It only became important once it left Africa. And this binary of black and white is a European fantasy. It's a colonial fantasy of divide and rule. So, you know, Africa is a continent of 54 countries, more than 2,000 living languages, which dates back to the origin of the species. How can we reduce that to a, a color? You know, and then you have the work of, you know, the big black square on the exhibition with all these, like, hundreds of different colors of black. You know, what's interesting is black has many, many, many different colors. White is either white or off-white. Now, the thing is, how are we going to reduce Africa to something singular, binary, dualistic, in terms of skin color? You know, and and what's, what's, what's really terrifying is that while we can accept the concept of African-Americans, why can't we accept the concept of white Africans? That's sinking for a minute. <laughs> so, so, so building on that, um, one of the debates, because you mentioned, you know, as Africa was being divided, Africans weren't invited to that discussion. And one of the debates that's going on right now is, as we're looking at museums and we're looking at the curators in those museums, there's a clear lack of Africans that are being represented. Yes. More and more it's increasing, such as yourself, Smooth, but there is still that lack, and there's the discussion of we need more Africans. What do you think the African perspective, again, the Afrocentric perspective, brings into that uh, curatorial effort in museums as they're representing African art? When you say museums, what museums are you talking about? Oh, don't put me on the spot like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's no but, but no, but like... So do you mean museums in the Western context? I mean, 
Well, museum is a Western construct, right? So when, um, when you say... And we'll come on to that when we talk about restitution, but when we're looking at some of the Western museums right okay. now, there is a debate that a lot of the curators that are responsible for the African collections mm. are white, mm. um, and that we need more Africans that can speak to how these pieces were potentially used in the historical context mm. um, outside of just the aesthetic view of a piece. Um, so what, what, what does that bring into it, being an African? Is that important, or is this just something that's super topical because of restitution? Well, I mean, I... I mean, a lot of people will shoot me, but anyway, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. Um, I think that that knowledge and experience and expertise has less to do with the color of the skin. You know, and when you... And I know, especially in the United States, there's a big push for diversity. Um, but I also make the case that as far as, as much, I mean, diversity is very important. Um, but diversity should, shouldn't be done on the basis of, uh, of tokenism, you know, because we, we have to diversify, you know. Um, then we have to hire people, we have to find those people. Now, the question is if, now, the, that's the other question. If, if you hire, in my situation, if you hire, like when I was at the Cleveland Museum of Arts, you hire me as someone who's, who, who's been trained to speak, to understand Africa uh, through a particular lens, does that give me power, really, to change the conversation? It could be yes, or it could be no. You know, because I was trained in the United States, and my training of my understanding of African art has been shaped uh, from an American position, you know, does that mean that being African, African born, does it, if, does it, does it, does it play, play any role in the way I interpret Africa to an American audience? So when people make a push for diversity in that sense, we need African, African born people, which is important, so people don't get me wrong. Um, the question is, do we need them because there's a Western push for, Afri for African-born curators, or for African curators, or will they be empowered to really change the, 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 to change the conversation in ways that people in Africa will recognize themselves in the objects when they come to, the, to, to those museums? And I don't think we've answered that question well enough. You know, I just went uh, over to uh, the Tovaren to see... Um, um, Topical right yeah, now. The, uh, the museum over there, <laughs> yes. you know, and then, uh, and then I saw the way the conversation changed from, from African in intermediaries mm. to African experts, mm. you know. Um, but I don't know exactly what that means in the context of the museum because the, the, the language, the colonial language, has not, has not been shared yet. It's still, it's still very much visible. So do you invite those voices uh, to satiate uh, the audience, or do you really, really empower people change it by changing or changing the structure of the institution in itself to recognize that there are different ways of understanding um, uh, those objects, and that there's a particular perspective that, that Africa brings to its object? That should be the question. You know, will the structure of the, the internal structure of, of the museum in itself evolve? to allow for deep conversations, or rather than saying, oh, we can't change this object because it's part of the architecture of the museum, where in a, in a, in a, in a sense, the object in itself continues to bear witness to the violence of colonialism. I mean, I do, would always advocate complexity rather than simplification, especially when it comes to art, because, and I also very often take a question like that and flip it around. So the National Gallery in Cape Town has a very large collection of European art, classic European art. Would you then say the only people allowed to be curators have to be white European descendants? No, of course not. On the other hand, you know, um, Mondrian was a deeply spiritual person. Could an atheist curator like, like Smooth curate an exhibition of Mondrian? What did he call <laughs> Non-spiritual. <laughs> I can describe myself as that. Okay. <laughs> Forgive me. Forgive me. <laughs> no, my point being that do you have to be a spiritual person to curate an exhibition of Mondrian? I think not. But if you, if you are familiar with 
the, the spiritual practices of Mondrian, you might be able to access more layers of meaning and be a more sensitive curator and have more empathy for the object. And I think that very often there's a hysteria on the subject of Africa that just doesn't put it into a context and like, wait a minute, if we exchange the object for a European object and then consider it from, a, from another point of view, let's go to Cape Town and look at European art, does the same hysteria apply? And then, you know, and that gives it a bigger perspective and I think that, I think definitely right now, there's a need to redress the imbalance of power in Europe and the United States and a lot of these old, um, these, these very white, strong um, countries with very white, strong uh, museum directors and people of power. That needs to be addressed. But I don't think one needs to fall into tokenism and, you know, and, 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 and start to look at art from a, t a checklist of um, criteria, which actually has nothing to do with the ability to empathize with the objects. So speaking about power, when we talk about the historical pieces specifically, one of the names that comes up over and over and over again is Picasso. Oh, Picasso went to the flea market and he saw these pieces and he felt the spirit, you know, and th these objects can exorcise the demons from... And, and it's almost like we need Picasso to understand African art. Why do we feel the need to mention Picasso? Because yesterday when you were doing the tour, you did mention Picasso as well. Why do we feel the need to mention the modernists um, when we're talking about the classic pieces of art? Can African art not stand on its own without Picasso? I think it should. Yeah, I think it should. I think, um, I mean, there's a, the, the hysteria about, and I've said this severally, that there's always a reaction to Europe. Uh, the European, the Eurocentric position, it's, it's, all, it's always reactionary, you know, and there's a reason for that, because of a history of, uh, of, of uh, intellectual violence, uh, in addition to physical violence, I, I get that history, but I think that we shouldn't obsess um, in, in when, you, when, you, when you want to, when, when you want to this, because you think that there's a legitimacy that Picasso conveys on the object when you, when you posit Picasso's name, you know, I don't think that should be the case. I think they, and then that what I do in my practice, you know, um, um, is to say that the object, the first I think, I think of the objects as objects of history because that's something that historical, and that's why I don't use classical, I use historical because there's always a denial of history. To the, the objects are not granted history because they are viewed as ethnographic objects. And so they're, 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 the, history, the history they carry with them are not often contextualized. And that's the history of the people, that, that's the history of the people over centuries and the way in which their way of seeing the world has changed through those objects. Because no one single, um, and I'm going to use Penda for example, which is uh, a European construction in that sense, no single Penda mask uh, is the same. You know, one, what is often denied when, when people talk about Penda mask, or not just Penda, or even uh, Sonia or, 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 or Congo objects is, the idea that even the form in itself continued to evolve as people responded to the changes in their reality, those things are often not contextualized. And I think the emphasis for me, um, as a scholar of African art, is to understand what changed those objects. And one exhibition that sort of tried to answer that question is the Congo show, uh, which was organized at the Met in 2016, where, where um, not all the arguments, I don't agree with all the arguments, but the argument that, that struck me was the way in which the Nkisi began to grow. From, I mean, of course, there are various kinds of Nkisi. There's the, the, the more personal Nkisi to the communal Nkisi. But you realize that Nkisi began to grow. And it began to grow because the enemy became more potent, more powerful. And so the object had to grow because there's an express belief in the object to ward off uh, danger, to protect from the enemy. And when the, the en enemy began to be seen as more powerful, the object had to grow, had to be bigger to contend with a more, a more powerful uh, enemy. And so when we have those conversations, we don't often think of, we don't even look at the object as object. You know, we don't think, think of the object as bearing in them history, uh, textual history that can be read, you know. And so we miss that point when, when we be, begin to obsess with, with, with the, the, the Eurocentric uh, position on those objects. The objects in themselves carry enough stories that we need to unpack. Or does Picasso make it accessible to, to whom? a wider audience? What wider audience? Well, Picasso certainly makes it accessible to the European people who are familiar with Picasso. Mm. And in that way, Picasso is a reference. He's not an unimportant reference. He's not an unimportant artist. 
Um, but at the same time, one of the issues that I always have taken with African exhibitions that try to link contemporary and classic or link Picasso is that, you know, the Africans are always the sideshow. It's, it's, it's a bit like the, the opening act, but the small opening act. I mean, there was the Picasso primitive at Cape Only with a big bugger mask. It was one of the worst bugger masks I ever saw. I mean, you could buy better in a flea market. Now, that was sitting at Cape Horn Lee. Okay, Picasso saw that and it spoke about the influence, but nothing compared to the bugger mask on the show here. Now, that's the thing is that when African art is there as the side shows, the side actors, the less important um, thing that Picasso took inspiration from, then it's pejorative. Then it's, but here, when you see the, 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 the Pende mask that inspired Le Dames de Avignon, it doesn't need Picasso. It's better than Picasso. It sits there, it's strong, and it speaks to you directly without the need to loop back to Picasso. Wow. OK, so um, we've got about 20 minutes or so left. And one of the things that I do want to touch on specifically, Kendall, is this where you've got the Damien Hirst <laughs> surrounded by incredible masks. Why? Why do we have an if ahead created again by a European artist, by a British artist, surrounded by exceptional pieces of African art? What? I mean, this, I like to call this room my Afro shrine in a very specific then um, homage to Fela Kuti, who was an artist and an activist, musician, and very vocal about his ideas of identity. And what this Afro shrine upstairs proposes or opens up is this, this dialogue with histories, that every single object in that room has these, these strings of history which take them back to context. Um, and those histories are important and need to be spoken about, and everyone is individual and, and okay. We don't go into it in this exhibition, but one can research them. Now, the, the history of the Damien Hirst is also interesting. First of all, who were the Eiffel? Why did they make that sculpture in the first place? So the, the object that's on the exhibition, part, no, the, let's say the original Eiffel head, passed through the British Museum at some point. A copy was made, a mold was taken. Now this is interesting, this is a European museum making a, a copy. It's not one of the stolen works from the Benin bronzes. It's not one of the looted works. It passed through the British Museum, a mold was made. It went then to the museum in Nigeria and it was stolen. So now this object is not lost, it's just missing, it's somewhere in the world, I mean, it's obviously being taken care of um, by whoever stole it. Now this is, uh, and what Damien Hirst did is he made a copy of something that we don't have access to um, and parted it off as his own. But what's interesting is that when you look at the object, he didn't pay attention to the patina or the detail, he just, he just cast it in a very almost lazy way because he didn't really understand the idea of how the Eiffel head could be embodied compared to what the, what the real Eiffel heads, how they would be, you know, how they would be made and, and, and the patinas and the edge. And, it, and what I, the way that room is, is, is constructed, you can look through the, the, the mask of folly or the mask of illness or the quelle mask. You can look through the eyes at the Damien Hirst and there's a spot on the, pe on the, the, the mirror floor where there's a, 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 a missing pedestal where you're invited to join the discussion. And this, the idea of that installation is join the discussion and ask yourself, who has the right to speak for the IFI? Because present day Nigeria and the historical IFI, is that even a connection? Is that even something that, 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 we, can, that we can speak about? Um, is it only Nigerians who have the right to speak about IFI? Or is it all Africans? Who has the right to decide what African art is and what it is not? Who has the right to judge African art? Who has the right to say, you know, in South Africa, there's a, there's a lot of people who say that Picasso stole African art. Was he stealing or was he quoting? And so that's the idea of this exhibition. And, and really to sit there and look at how a European artist constructs his fantasy of the market and leans on Africa in order to embody his idea of market, surrounded by ritualized objects that were danced and embodied and extremely evocative. Now, from one point of view, it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the Pende mask that is so powerful. From another point of view, it's the, it's the, the captain of the market, um, Damien Hurst. And, that, you know, the, and the whole point about the room for the mirrors is it's up for you to decide. You know, the great thing about art is it should not be moralistic. Because as soon as art becomes moralistic, artists lose their contact with that, that deep-rooted spiritual core. Because spirit can never moralize. And so, take the morality out of it, and then engage in the discussion. What do you think of the Afro Shrine? 
I mean, I had this conversation with Kendall where I, I said, um, I mean, yesterday he describes, um, um, how did you describe him again? Damien Hurst as a, uh, what was your word again? I want the exact word. <laughs> Don't you remember. You remember, of course. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, yeah, I want that word because it's very important you say the word, the way you describe him. A, a talentless artist, you know, a hack, basically, you know. Um, but he needed a hack in his, in his show. You know, you know, why would you need a hack in your show? You know, so, so we can have this discussion because without it, <laughs> because the whole point about art being amoral is that it needs to transcend contradiction. And if I curate an exhibition and only have the work I like, mm. then you're speaking to the converted. It's important to also speak, it's also important to challenge yourself and put works on the exhibition that destabilize your, the, your, your formula. But isn't it a question of value as well? Because if a visitor, uh, you know, an exhibition visitor is going into this room and they see a Damien Hirst, they almost blur out everything else that's around this Damien Hirst and they zoom in on his if head. So isn't it also a question of what we're placing value on and by having him in the middle of individual incredible pieces, you're taking away the value of the historical African art? Well, I'm, I like to say this. Where, I mean, I want to go back to what we said about, about Picasso and Africa, where you, when you don't have any conversation, when you, whenever you start a conversation about, about Africa mid the West, it's mediated to, to the, to, to, through the actions of Picasso and, his, and, and, and Brack and the others and his friends, you know. And so you can think of this, this shrine. I mean, that's the other way to think about, about the shrine as um, when you, want to, when you want to focus attention on the shrine, which is, goes back to the question of value, when you want to focus attention on the shrine, you think about Damien Hirst there. So the man has become a modern Picasso in your show, you know. But to the question about morality um, uh, and the idea that art shouldn't lend itself to that, and at the same time, you are inserting Damien Hirst as a way of raising question about morality. Yes, except you're invited to decide what you think. I'm not telling you what I think. That's the whole point of that installation, is that there is no simple answer there. Some people will see the Damien Hirst as, you know, I'm looking at it here from this angle, it looks like he's about to have his head cut off. From another angle, they could be worshipping him. I mean, you don't know if this is a tribunal or if they're about to devour him in, a, in, a, in some kind of cannibal ritual. You know, and it's, it's really up to you to decide what do you th Where do you... Because I think the important thing about politics is if I'm telling you what I think, who I vote for, mm -hmm. you're just going to agree with me or disagree with me. So there's no transformation. Nothing changes. However, if I put you in a situation like that, where we, the fact that we're having this discussion means it's unclear, which means you having these discussions inside your head, which means you challenging your own ideas of aesthetics and politics and value, which means transformation is taking place. Okay. So let me tell you what I, my first impression when I, when I encountered the, um, I encountered the, uh, the installation. From a distance, I saw the Ife head. I said, how did Syndica get <laughs> an Ife head? <laughs> an Ife head. And I mean, maybe we, should also, maybe we should also say that buying an original Ifa head is Definitely. illegal. An original is absolutely illegal, for those of you who don't so that was, know. That was from, from a distance I saw it. I said, am I seeing correctly? You know, and then I came close, and then it was a Damien Hurst. And, and, then, I, and, then, I, and, I, and then I recalled the, the, the controversy at Venice and all of that. You know. uh, but but, I, but I, I think... Can you explain I, the controversy of Venice? So, 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 so Damien basically sort of... Uh, he took icons from other cultures and made rep uh, replicas of, of those icons and then had that installed at Venice in 2017. And then um, a Nigerian artist who was exhibiting in the Nigerian pavilion saw, saw the Ife head and then complained that uh, Damien was basically appropriating, that he was um, always appropriating stuff, and that finally his appropriation has come to Africa. And then it became a contest over who has the right to appropriate um, uh, what object? So that, so that was a sort of con controversy, um, which ended up serving, uh, serving Damien and not the artist, hence the reason why you collected the work, because, because part of it's a controversy, you know. All the works like this, most of the works at Venice ended up being sold or been bought by collectors, you know. So if they... I think we should ask Syndica why he collected rather than assuming. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah. <laughs> 
Because um, I was intrigued. I was intrigued, and and the way the way I collect, the way we worked on this show with the uh, with Kendall, like he said, is a friendship, is also trust, is also a path. Like we were like explorers, exploring ourselves, and and putting the the best way to explore yourself is to put yourself in front of your own contradictions. Right. And I felt very uncomfortable with this. Um, The question of, of him using that, of course I understand, he's smart. He takes his uh, 10-year-old kid and say, do something, mm. like put some paint on this thing, and then he rolls it on the system, and then he sells a series for a for million dollars. So I so understand the, the provocation and where it's come from and what it's about. But the real idea for me was to say, well, this raises a question of a number of questions. And I said, well, this, I'm, I'm sort of feeling uncomfortable out of my comfort zone, and this is where, where we make progress. We have to sometimes push ourselves out of the comfort zone. What I love about the installation now, because I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have shown it, I, I just wanted to keep it, and I thought, well, I need to think about this, you know? And, I, and that's why I wanted to have it, because it, it raised a number of very, very good questions that made me very uncomfortable with what I'm doing, which question really the sense and the meaning of what it is that I'm doing by like all the questions that uh, Adenike, who's, who's brilliantly smart and vicious in her questions and shots being fired, like with, with tough questions about Africans, about what it means, African art, mm. does it make sense? Mm. Do spirits exist? Are they really alive? Mm. What does it mean out of the context, etc., etc.? The thing that I love in, is the way the poetry. Sometimes you cannot explain. This is a little bit the limit and always the, the problems I have with the, with, the, with the work, the job of a curator. Mm. Is that sometimes the whole point of art is not to be explained, it's just to, to be, like, mm. like, like a poem. And I thought the idea of using that work in a, in a, a very poetic, that I find beautiful, because the, the work of art, this is what I found beautiful. You asked the question about, are we not the, the, the public now? Are we not the people? Because you said the community, exactly. Yeah, yeah. said, are we not the community? I think it's really interesting because at the end of the day, when I say the, 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 uh, all these masks are not the artwork. Every single one is a masterpiece. None of them is what I show and I revere as being a masterpiece because it's really a, a medium, a tool used for the performance, the masquerade. Uh, nevertheless, in this case, these masterpieces have been put in museum of ethnology so basically ethnology being the science of the different the other the one that's not me exotize sort of make make it exotic okay and killed the gods what that were that were in them from that perspective and the fact that now they are characters the fact that it is an artist the artwork exactly like in the masquerade the mask is a masterpiece but the art is the, the, the installation. I very much like that idea. And I very much like the idea that it's poetic, it's beautiful. I mean, when you look at it, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just beautiful and it's just powerful. I don't know if the spirits exist. What I know is if you put, if we go now and probably the lights are off and we put you there, I'd like you to repeat, the spirits don't exist or they don't exist out of Africa. I mean, you. you you will feel that. I'm, it's an experience that I... Well, I, I feel an energy. Yeah, well, yes. But in this sense, the, in this, exactly the no, sense no, no, that no, Kendall... No, no, and no, maybe no. in a way that is a question mark and not a definition. Like, it's, it doesn't delimit or define what it is. Mm -hmm. So I, I like the idea that actually uh, we have found a use for this mm -hmm. fake if ahead. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, is a beautiful, it is a beautiful statement, mm. and I love it as an artwork, as an installation, mm. because it raises a number of questions, exactly like poetry. Instead of ending up with a final dot, it mm. ends up with a, an infinity of different directions, and it raises this kind, and it, it's the opportunity, actually, to create this kind of debate that I find really, I'm having a lot of fun. I want to thank you for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. So unfortunately, for the sake of time, we can't cover the restitution debate. I mean, we could be here for hours if I asked that question. But just very briefly, Kendall, if you could touch on um, this section of the exhibition, what is it about, um, what has the foundation done, and ultimately, how did this Chukwe mask end up in the show? 
Well, I mean, that's, there's, there's not much time to go through that, yeah. but the, the, the long and the short of it is, um, this is the only room in the exhibition that looks different than the others. And what you have on the walls are the, is basically the records of a museum in Angola, the Dundo Museum, that has been looted. And these objects are out in the world somewhere. And the great thing about art is it doesn't disappear. Somebody is taking care of these objects. And again, as a philanthropist and as a patron, what Syndica is doing is he has a team of people, and Agnes is over there, and she hates it when we say Agnes is over there. So I'll say Agnes is over there. She can stand up. She hates it when I ask her to stand up. <laughs> and Agnes finds these objects in collections, in auction houses, wherever, finds these objects, and a, a gentle negotiation takes place in which the works are basically acquired and then eventually returned back to Angola. Now, what's really important is that, I mean, I don't know many people in the world today who are actively actually finding solutions to the question of restitution. There's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of desire, there's a lot of political pressure, there's a lot of lobbying, but Syndicate is actually doing it while everybody's talking. And for that, I find it absolutely extraordinary that he's raising the bar to the level of, and, and in that way, what's really important is both with the collection and with this idea of restitution as a role model, a role model for other African people to follow, a role model for, to, to be a trailblazer, to actually make a difference proactively, rather than, you know, again, instead, instead of sitting back and begging Europe to give you back your stolen art, you can actually go out there and take Europe by the balls and squeeze them until the work comes back. And that's, you know, in, in essence, what he's doing is he's challenging the, the, the market structure and calling out dealers or collectors who, who might think it's okay to trade these stolen works of art, even knowing that they're stolen. And the, the, the excuses are now running out, and that's really important because as more and more excuses run out, so we need to start engaging with the, 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 the demand because, and what's really important is when, I mean, I will quote Syndicate not as well as he does it himself, but these the stolen works of art, like the, the, like the Queen of Yorba head in the British Museum, this is not a mask. This is not even a spirit. This is the coronation. This is the crown jewels. You know, it was the crown jewels that were stolen during the, the 1897 punitive raid that's sitting in the British Museum and the Metropolitan Museum. This is what creates cultural unity. This is what creates heritage. Now, how dare the British say, on the one hand, well, we're, gonna, we're not going to give back your crown jewels, but why don't you have cultural unity? You know, these things are connected, and I think it's very important also to acknowledge that Africa, without its art, it's not about museums, it's about heritage. Without its art, I mean, we can't have an intelligent discussion about what Africa is. And the first step is to know your own history, and the first step of colonialism was to destroy history. Yes, okay, so I think we have time. We're actually going to open it up to questions now. So there is a question just over there, and we'll go over to the second. Thank you for this discussion. Uh, I know that the, the, this notion was uh, used to denigrate the African cultures uh, during uh, the, the colonization. But I, I, ask, I want to ask why we... Um, uh, don't we use the, the, the notion of a fetish object to uh, express the embodiment of social reality in the, uh, this uh, art object at the end? Because a fetish is that, is uh, the incarnation of, of the reality or in an, an object. And I, I, want, I, I didn't hear this, uh, this notion and I wanted to know why. So I think the question goes back to nomenclature, right? It's called fetish. Why haven't we mentioned fetish? Why haven't we mentioned primitive? Why haven't we mentioned tribal in this discussion? Well, I think you'll have to respond to the fetish question because you beautifully discussed it yesterday. Yeah. But, I mean, the thing, okay, fetish, um, I mean, if you, in, in my catalog essay, I mean, you can read that. The, in fact, the word fetish is coming from the Portuguese word fetichio, which, mean, which is coming from facere in Latin, and it means to make in the idea of to, to cast a spell, because the objects were called Nkisi. And for the people who made the objects, the Nkisi was both the spirit and the object. And, from, and when the Portuguese sailors were arriving in that part of Africa, they, they could not call these objects art, because they were so outside their frame of reference, they invented this word fetichio. Fetichio translates into fetish, and eventually Freud popularizes it. But now here's the problem, is that at this point of origin, it was not pejorative. 
And the way Freud uses it, it's not pejorative. You know, if we're talking about cultural fetish, in that sense, the, the whole exhibition is about that, this idea of art being a witness, art being a social embodiment of a politics, a spirit, a charge, a, an identity, a gender, a, a sexual orientation, or whatever. And in that way, we can speak about fetish in the fetishization of processes. However, when we speak about fetish in relation to specifically African art, it conjures up this idea of savagery, primitivism, which now savagery and primitivism from the point of view of Rambo is very positive and something very empowering and something very profound and deep and emancipatory. However, from the colonial point of view, it is very reductive because it's, you know, in the exhibition you see the, the video of um, Tracy Moffat where you see black people are reduced to noble savages, eroticized, romanticized, generalized cliché. So they're not humans, they become clichés. And so the reason why I resist this idea of calling those objects fetish is because you, you're implying a savagery which is a colonial fantasy rather than giving them the respect of the power that they embody. I will say those who made the objects never called the objects fetish. So why would you call them fetish? What about primitive and primal? It's the same thing. Same thing. Uh, there was another question there in the corner. Uh, I noticed that when we were talking about the last room in the exhibition, the word installation was used. So my question is, what is the difference between an artist making a large installation and what a curator does? First of all, um, I, again, cannot speak on behalf of curators, but I am an artist who believes in spirit. And when I make an installation, I'm embodying a spirit. Um, and when I create an installation, I'm not thinking in terms of... In a way, I'm thinking about the Gustav Kunstwerk, the idea of the sensorial, the, you know, the full experience with your entire body. But I mean, I'm sure a curator could also have that same thought. I'm not saying that it's unique, but I think that perhaps the way an artist will approach exhibition making, there'd be a different sensitivity to materials because Let's, okay, let's be frank. I mean, when you make stuff, and maybe that's what makes you a good curator because you, you're, you're, you're rooted in being an artist, is that... I don't know if I am a good one. You are, you are, you are. Um, so, artists make stuff. And for that reason, the mythology of making stuff goes out the window. And curators who don't make stuff very often get lost in the mythology of confusing what it is to make stuff. And so they romanticize it and mythologize it. And, and it, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a rootedness. When I make exhibitions, it's rooted in a deep respect and understanding for artists above market, above, sorry, Sandiga, but I think you would agree, above collectors, above, above all the functionaries that surround the, the, the object. Because, you know, one of the details that I, is important to remember is that you have your altar embodying your, your saint or your, your, your Christ. Around the altar, you built your church. Around your church, you have your square. Around the square, you have the village. You, know, you put the work of art at the center. And a lot of what happens today in the art system is we forget that art is at the center. And we instead, we put the collector or the curator at the center. I, I would say that curating is very subjective, so, but then what happens is the curator often thinks he or she takes two or three steps back, and so you don't, you don't and that it's presenting to you, he or she's presenting to you um, an, an objective story, you know, so what you see is the curator hides behind the mask, you know, but the artist allows you to have a visceral reaction to the exhibition, hence the sort of conversation we're having. I would say that when you look at that exhibition, uh, it's in the image and likeness of Kendall, you know? And so you have a visceral response to it, as opposed to begin... So, so when a curator curator wants you to think about art history first before you think about the object. When an artist is curating, you want to think about the object first, before art history. And I think we have... Oh. One Actually, just, just, I, f I find the question really interesting. Actually, the, the thing is, my, my perspective on this is that the function is curator. But artist, Kendall is an artist. So the interesting part is that the thing that he is an artist, he cannot cease to be 
he could not curate, for instance. But that's the interesting part, is that for me, incarnations the way here in Beaux-Arts is an artwork. And I was talking about the poetry. I think the, and this is what I said about the, the whole approach of the initiation in the parcours, because the, it's, it's the same thing like the mask again. There's a mask, which is, a, which is the artwork, and then there's the masquerade, that is the artistic proposal. It's the artistic world. And what I like in an artist generally is his capacity to bring us into his world, his capacity to control his vocabulary in this world, and the level of elegance and poetry. This is to me the three aspects that I look at when I look at a work and I decide to, to work, I don't like to say to buy, but to work with an artist. And this is what I love about this show here, is that this is really Kendall's world. This is his imagination, this is why he stands... Kendall wakes up in the morning, he jumps out of bed and wants to say something, he wants to fight, he wants... Everything is so intense, it's so him, uh, so it's interesting because I like to, unfortunately it closes tomorrow, but then it gives you a chance for everybody to go and check it out tomorrow again. When you go and you visit it with, with Kendall, you visit it with a curator. He will explain things. What I think this show deserves is to, one, to listen to the curator, and second, without him when he's not there or with him silent, to discover the artist, his world, his universe that he's recreated. And I like the idea that he's, the, what is, finds very often like a decoration. So the, 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 the red and white with the believe and the lie, it's an artwork. It's everywhere. Just to give you, this is, reminds me, I'll just share the experience because you remember when we were in Valencia at Ivam, that was like ages, the, the, I think 2005 maybe. So that's already like 15 years ago. So we did this show in Ivam, and everybody was asking, well, where is the African show? Because when they opened the door, there was like videos everywhere. It was very contemporary, miles away from what people would expect an African show would be. And then the two last uh, pieces in the exhibition, so I was going out with the, I, I was doing the opening with the lady who's the, who's the manager, or the, how do you call that, the, 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 the director, the director of, uh, of, of and, and it was a group of, uh, patrons of the museum, so all Spanish, so very Catholic, and there was this big artwork. So you see the the, the artwork with the kisi with the with the with the nails that that Kendall has covered with the white and um, red uh, plastic band. It was a huge cross, a Christ in cross, huge, all uh, uh, put in plastic, and around it like some black tart that had a sort of a vaginal shape like, the shape like that, with in God wet rust. And, and everybody, so I, I, it was very funny for me, because I took the lady like that, and I said, do you like this? And she went, ah, with and all the Spaniards started to try to steer away from that, because they felt very uncomfortable to this thing. And the, the, the wall next to us was actually the fuck wall. So basically, it's, it's a, it's a, it, we have it everywhere, it's a little bit like believe, but it's written in subversive uh, fuck, 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 and it looks like a, a nice, tribal, comforty thing. And, and physically, I could see all the people in the room looking at the Christ, getting away, and she said, I like this, it's nice. And everybody started <laughs> staring to the fuck wall, which I thought was so amazing, because he managed to trick us. It was such a, such a moment for me of, of happiness. I, I found it so funny. I was like by myself laughing and laughing and laughing at everybody's reaction. And this is what I like about the show here, is that the show itself is an art proposal. Is the way, and, it, and it raises questions about how art, artistic proposals interfere in our society, in our lives. Does it have to be in a museum? It, it also raises questions about collect, collectionism. Is, does collecting make sense as a, an abundance of objects put next one to another? All these questions are raised in a very um, a relevant and very elegant way because he's an artist, he's a, he's a smart artist, he's an African artist, he's a guy who paid the price to be African. He was almost um, um, what, harassed by, by some uh, black women who accused him of being responsible of being white and a man. And unfortunately, I wasn't then to, there to defend him, but what I told everybody afterwards, I said, if, if anybody deserves to, to say something, has a right, has owned a right, you know, it's exactly like in Angola, 
where I live, you have a lot of white Angolans. But the particularity about Angola is that it has, it has determined itself through a recent history made of war. It is the country in Africa where the Cold War has been really a, a hard, very uh, brutal war against racist South Africa and then um, a civil war but, but fueled by other influences. And you have their general, like three stars, who are as black as my mother, like white people. Nobody would dare question their Africanity because they know there were four brothers, three died in the, in the war, and then the other guy is a general who made it, we don't even know how. So it's exactly the same thing with, with Kendall, and I think this is why I'm really, really, really happy about the show, because it was so... Kendall tried to convince me of so many things, and I was, I was hesitant. And I thank you for trusting our friendship enough to put it through so much tension that you literally gave me shit so many times by saying, Sinica, this is not acceptable. We need to do this. It needs to be done like that. We need to try that. I said, Kendall, are you sure? It is, it, it is risky. It's not going to work. I don't understand how it's going to make sense. And then at some point, when I, when I visited the show, I showed it to my kids today, and we went with, with, with my children, um, and I was really happy because they were in the middle of an artwork. It was a moment of celebration, of artistic celebration. And I really, I love you for this, and I thank you for this as a friend and a brother. Bravo. So, we are out of time, but he's been dying no. to ask a question. No, 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 no. No, you I'm can not ask, gonna, No, I'm you can gonna. ask your question, but you have to answer the question in one sentence. You won't be able to. <laughs> Uh, all I can say is, uh, you, Kendall, you invited me to come and speak from the floor, so, and my contribution uh, should be longer, but we don't have time for it. But I will say very briefly, what I'm experiencing in terms of philosophy is um, what I will call finding a voice, which I've just felt has always been the struggle for Africans or people from outside of Europe operating as artists, as historians, as writers, is about finding a voice. And this exhibition for me is very much, much about finding a voice because I think the thing we fear most is the lack of voice, a denial of voice. And what we have learned over a very long struggle of over 100 years is to try and get a voice to create what I would call a liberated space where that voice can speak. And this exhibition is one of those liberated spaces where the voice can speak. But so much of what we've discussed in the last hour has been about um, not our voice, but about how others perceive that voice. Uh, we are asking, why is smooth at MoMA? <laughs> why, what? This is, for me is a ridiculous question. But it has to do with this empowerment you get when you have a voice and you have a liberated space in which you can conduct the conversation the way you want it, not as others perceive how the conversation should be conducted. So my question was going to be to you, if we all believe that Africans have a quality and an ability to do anything as much as any other human being, but we constantly talk about embodiment in an artwork, what happens when an artist's work, an African artist's work, is not about that embodiment? What happens when there is no narrative? What happens when there is no definable subject or recognizable subject? What happens when an African artist makes a work of art that has, is non-subjective or non-figurative? Where would we place that work and how would we want the world to perceive that? That's my question. One sentence. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> I mean, for it's me, it's possible. an easy, it's an easy question to answer because, indeed, I mean, one of the issues is to learn to decolonize our mind, stop apologizing, reaffirm our identity, 
be African, be strong, but also, and I insist to say, this is a proposal. It's not the first, nor is it the last word. It's one proposal for a continent, and I'll say it again, like a cliche, of 54 countries and 2,000 living languages. There's a lot of space for a lot of things. We cannot generalize, and we certainly cannot reduce Africa to embodiment. Exactly. It's, it's, my, it's my fear that what I'm seeing is a lot of work that relates to readable subjects, readable things that we already recognize, yet the, the beauty of the experience of the Portuguese who call these things fetish was about discovering things they do not recognize. I mean, Africans make work that you do not recognize, which is the perceived view that an African does not indulge in non-figurative work. When an African does that, that's the same Menkisi experience one more time. The only difference is, do we have a voice now to deal with that within the institutions of the, of the art world? And Smooth? Yeah, but what I'll say to that is what I said earlier on, which is why I have a pro attention with, with the idea of Positan spirit. You know, I said, people try to make sense of their reality, and you make sense of your reality in different ways. And so, uh, the sense of abstraction, uh, of, of understanding reality conceptually is something that I think is very important, you know, and that, which is at the heart of your question. So if we move away from the figurative, how other ways can people understand Africa? It's, it's, it's a valid question. And it's, it's something I said, you know, that, that we should begin to elevate our conversation to move away beyond the tropes, you know. The tropes are necessary, but we can get beyond that. We can think about, even when you consider the tropes, uh, the idea of the spirit, in what other ways might we imagine the spirit uh, theoretically, conceptually, because that elevates the conversation, and you don't have to answer to anyone. With that, thank you all so much for your questions. Thank you for being here. Kendall, Ugo Chukwu Smooth, thank you all so much for your insights. And uh, if you have any follow-on questions, we'll be sure to answer them offline. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.